Good evening and welcome to This Week in Turkey. A court in Ankara ruled on Wednesday to lift the ban on Wikipedia after a decision by the Constitutional Court stated that the ban breached freedom of expression. In the ruling of the Constitutional Court, it has been indicated that blocking access to Wikipedia does not comply with the requirements of a democratic societal order and the website contains no grave content that would justify the access block. The decision puts an end to the ban, which has been in place since April 2017, due to entries that accuse Turkey of having links to terrorist organizations. Access to Wikipedia is currently blocked from China and Venezuela. Turkish and Syrian heads of intelligence met in Moscow on January 13 in the first official contact in years despite Ankara's long-standing hostility towards Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. The head of Turkey's national intelligence organization Hakan Fidan met with the head of the Syrian National Security Bureau Ali Mamluk and discussed a number of issues including the ceasefire in Syria's Idlib and possible coordination against the Kurdish presence in northern Syria. The discussions included the possibility of working together against YPG, the terrorist organization PKK's Syrian component in the east of the Euphrates River, a Turkish official said. Both sides have said there have been intelligence contacts, but this is the first explicit acknowledgement of such a senior meeting. Sana News Agency said Syria's intelligence chief called on Turkey to fully adhere to the sovereignty of Syria, its independence and territorial integrity, as well as the immediate and full withdrawal from the whole Syrian territory. While Turkey has backed rebels seeking to oust al-Assad, Damascus has been supported by Russia. Erdogan has previously called al-Assad a murderer and the Syrian leader has branded the Turkish president a thief. In September 2018, Turkey and Russia agreed to turn Idlib into a de-escalation zone in which acts of aggression are expressly prohibited. Turkey launched an operation into northeastern Syria in October after the US pulled back its troops and abandoned its Syrian Kurdish partners. Erdogan said Tuesday that Turkey could resume its operations in Syria at any minute to prevent the regime's attempts to violate the ceasefire. Noting that previous ceasefires in Idlib were broken by the Syrian army, he said, this time the situation is different. Russian and Turkish presidents proposed a ceasefire last week in hopes of bringing an end to Libya's civil war. Representatives went to Moscow on January 13 for talks with Russian and Turkish diplomats and military officials. After more than eight hours of talks, the UN-recognized government of National Accords leader Fayez al-Saraj has accepted the ceasefire agreement, while Libyan National Army leader Khalifa Haftar has left Moscow without signing it. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Russia has stated that Haftar was granted a two-day time period to discuss the conditions of the draft ceasefire agreement with his allies. But President Erdogan said Haftar had run away. If the putschist Haftar's attacks against the people and legitimate government of Libya continue, we will never refrain from teaching him the lesson he deserves, Erdogan said in a speech to his Justice and Development Party lawmakers in parliament. Turkish Defense Minister Hulusi Akar said it was too early to say that the ceasefire in Libya had collapsed. On January 19, Germany will host a summit on Libya involving the rival camps, their main foreign backers, and representatives from the United Nations, the United States, Russia, Britain, France, China, Turkey, and Italy. Commenting on the summit, Akar said that a solution can be reached there. Four years after the petition, We Will Not Be Party to This Crime, was signed and published by the Academics for Peace. An event was organized at the Istanbul Chamber of Medicine, where many academics, experts in their field, came together for panels, forums, and a discussion. The event, entitled Four Years in Turkey and Academia, took place on January 11, four years after the peace petition was published. A panel entitled Peace, Labor and Rights Struggle, took place followed by a panel and discussion experience after the decree law, rights violations and possibilities for resistance. In January 2016, 2,212 academics, come to be known as the Academics for Peace, signed a declaration calling on the Turkish government to end the violence against the Kurdish population and resolve the conflict through peaceful means. Since that declaration, the signatories have been facing many attacks. Hundreds of them have been fired from their jobs, their passports have been cancelled and confiscated, they were prevented from finding jobs, several were physically and verbally threatened, others were taken into custody, 
Four of them who read a press statement condemning these violations were imprisoned. Hundreds have been robbed from the right to work in the public sector through governmental decrees. And finally, all of them are currently facing individualized courts. In July 2019, the General Assembly of the Constitutional Court examined the individual applications of 10 academics for peace who have been sentenced to prison on charge of propagandizing for a terrorist organization. The court ruled that the penalization of academics for peace on charge of terror propaganda has violated their freedom of expression. This evening, I have John Jandan with me in the studio. John Jandan is a faculty member at Boazici University's Western Languages, uh, Western Languages and Literature Department. Good evening, Mr. Jandan. Thank Good you evening. for joining us. Thanks. So you're one of the 2,212 signatories of the peace declaration um, calling the Turkish government to find a peaceful resolution to the Kurdish issue. Uh, in the Bill of Indictment prepared, there are expressions that would suggest that the freedom of expression allocated to academics due to their uh, public status should actually be uh, less or uh, is confined to a narrower space compared to regular citizens. However, you and others during their trials and defenses have uh, underlined on the contrary that due to your public status, your duty is not to abstain from speaking, but on the contrary, to, to speak the truth. So could you elaborate perhaps on this ethical stance and how it relates to the Kurdish issue at large? Sure. Um, let me begin with this piece of news from today. Mm -hmm. uh, Ismet Boskurt, the public prosecutor who issued the indictment against us, against Academics for Peace, for signing the peace declaration in um, January of uh, 2016, has just been removed from duty and banned from his profession uh, as a prosecutor by the official decision of the Council of Judges and Prosecutors. He was found guilty of taking bribes from prosecuted members of the Gulen movement to issue judgments in their favor. So this is the public prosecutor who has issued uh, the indictment against us. Now, about our ethical stance, uh, academics by definition and by universally accepted uh, tradition need to be independent thinkers. Mm -hmm. Um, who have the responsibility to seek the truth, assess social, political, ethical, artistic, uh, theoretical, practical issues and problems, and imagine responses and solutions to these issues and problems. Uh, along with this responsibility, of course, comes another responsibility, mm -hmm. and that's our uh, responsibility to the public. Um, and, uh, and to share our thoughts, to share our concerns, criticisms, suggestions, etc. Unfortunately, anti-democratic regimes uh, want to see academics as people who show absolute obedience to the state uh, and parrot state ideologies and support government policies without questioning. We, on the other hand, as Academics for Peace, believe that it is our ethical, academic and public responsibility to be critical and vocal about the wrongs that we see. Uh, the cultural and political rights of the Kurdish citizens of this country uh, have been violated by the state uh, for many years. And um, what we tried to do um, uh, with, with this uh, declaration uh, was actually to call uh, attention uh, to... Um, uh, uh, call attention... Uh, uh, to the, to yeah. the violations of human rights of the uh, Kurdish uh, citizens um, in certain Kurdish cities and, and towns that took place in 2015. Uh, and this has been documented actually by uh, many organizations, including national and international uh, human rights groups, commissions, uh, as well as media organizations, uh, etc. And that's what we wanted to call attention to. Uh, to, uh, to these crimes, and we also said that we will not be a party to uh, such a crime. But uh, not only that, uh, actually, we demanded that these violations would be halted, investigated, prosecuted, and everything would be done by those in power to um, come up with peaceful solutions to this problem. And we also offered our assistance as academics in these peace-building efforts. Uh, and not doing this actually would have been a violation of our responsibilities as academics. Yeah. Um, well, no doubt academics for peace have inspired many uh, citizen initiatives, 
but at the same time, it, it has also led to a fear of prosecution, which has uh, probably led to a form of auto-censorship, especially in the critical output of uh, um, academics in Turkey. Uh, how will this repression of the history or the dark side of state ideology affect Turkey's critical output and social memory in the long run? And do you still see universities as a site uh, or as a space for political struggle? Mm -hmm. um, well, after the peace declaration became public, uh, as, as you mentioned, uh, we were immediately uh, attacked uh, by the president, uh, followed by a mafia leader, as well as the right-wing press and certain bu bureaucrats at universities who call themselves academics, act uh, actually. Uh, these attacks inspired many actions of support um, by civilian initiatives. Uh, for example, over 400 filmmakers came together, uh, called themselves uh, Filmmakers for Peace, and um, uh, expressed their support for us. Uh, but of course, fear is a very powerful human uh, feeling, and uh, people in power know very well how to um, uh, incite fear and use unlawful legal means at their disposal to intimidate people. Uh, this fear of prosecution has, of course, led to self-censorship uh, for some people. Uh, but despite all this uh, intimidation, uh, we as Academics for Peace have been very vocal about our ongoing demand for peace, as well as about the ongoing violations of our basic rights. Uh, nevertheless, uh, unfortunately, this intimidation has dealt a severe blow to the academic environment in Turkey. Uh, with dire consequences, I think. Um, the academy has been silenced to a large degree, and uh, people, not just academics, but students and staff as well at universities, all of us have been burdened by this continuous attack at the academia by the government. Um, I'm especially sad and concerned about our students uh, who have been going through such, um, mm -hmm. such dark times. Mm -hmm. But I think in these dark times, academics, have, uh, academics for Peace have been... Uh, a source of light, uh, so to speak, and, and a source of inspiration um, uh, as an example of not giving up and of, of hope, actually. Uh, even though it may not look like it at the moment uh, in our country, historically speaking, universities have always been um, spaces for critical voices and also for social and political struggle uh, for a better world. Uh, as we recover from these blows, uh, that, that is dealt to us, we as academics will continue to work for a country where all of us can work freely uh, and in peace and do our work um, in a democratic uh, society. Mm -hmm. Without fears of uh, consequences. Exactly, without yeah. uh, fear of uh, persecution and without uh, of, uh, its consequences. Mm -hmm. And about social memory, um, you know, as the saying goes, you can run and hide from the truth, uh, you can deny and avoid the truth, uh, but you cannot destroy the truth. Uh, there are so many people who live, see, remember, and continue to speak the truth, and history continues to be written. Uh, so the question is, uh, you know, which side of history you want to be on? You know, do you want to be on the side of uh, human rights struggle, or do you want to be on the side of human rights violations? Do you want to be on the side of peace or do you want to be on the side of war? Um, and that's the issue, I think, that we need to uh, reflect on. Yeah. Um, Mr. Jandan, you, so the Constitutional Court ruled in favor of freedom of speech and you and others have been acquitted. Mm -hmm. But um, how will the fight against other uh, right breaches continue? For example, how uh, will uh, the fight uh, proceed in terms of the dismissal-related proceedings, for example? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think there's a kind of a misperception uh, mm -hmm. here in the public. Uh, despite the constitutional uh, court's ruling, uh, violations of human rights and fundamental rights of academics actually continue. Uh, firstly, none of us, not, not all of us have been acquitted. Uh, some of us have been acquitted, but some of mm -hmm. us have not been. Uh, to give you some numbers, um, there are still more than 200 academics uh, waiting to be acquitted, actually. And every second that they are not acquitted means that, uh, that every second violation of their freedom of speech is compounded. Um, secondly, uh, as you mentioned, uh, 406 academics actually were removed from their universities and banned from public service with the decree law since September of uh, 2016. Only a handful of them are reinstated. Almost 400 academics are waiting to be reinstated. 
And what about their lost time, their lost income since, that, since the time they, they were uh, dismissed? And uh, how will they be co uh, compensated? Uh, and what about the people who lost their lives and lost their health uh, due to these uh, violations? And that's a very important question that we need to ponder. And also, what about the freedom of movement of dismissed academics? Um, their, well, actually, not only theirs, but also their family members, passports have been canceled. Uh, although Turkey is a member of uh, United Nations and a party to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the European Convention on Human Rights, all of which contain the right of freedom of movement, Turkey still continues to violate this right. Uh, the state is refusing to issue them passports, even though they've been acquitted. Uh, so there are still hundreds of academics on either side of the border who cannot leave or enter their own country. Uh, another issue has been double uh, prosecution. For example, one of our colleagues, Professor Tuna Altinal from University Lyon 1 from France, has been on trial for being at an event, a legal event in France, uh, about the very human rights violations that we called attention to in our peace declaration. His next trial is next week, actually, on January 24th in Balıkesir, and we will all be there to demand that he is acquitted and his passport is reissued so that he can go back to his university to teach and to be with his students. So the struggle, despite the acquittals um, and despite the, um, the constitutional court's ruling, the struggle, for fight, uh, the struggle to fight uh, for our fundamental and human rights uh, actually uh, continues. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Mr. Jandan, for kind of summarizing the current situation four years after the declaration was signed. We'll be right Thank back you. with Mr. Jandan to speak about uh, other breaches of freedom of expression in cinema in particular. A new documentary uh, following the daily life of documentary filmmaker Chayan Demiral will be screened on January 24 at the Jezair Room in Bayola district of Istanbul. The event, which will be realized in honor of his birthday, aims to garner solidarity for the convicted filmmaker who has a 99% disabled report. Chayan Demirel and co-director Ertuğrul Mavioğlu were sentenced to four years and six months in prison by the Batman Second Heavy Penal Court on the grounds of propagandizing for a terrorist organization after a screening of their documentary North at the Batman Yılmaz Güney Cinema in 2015. The documentary North, which follows the daily lives of the outlawed Kurdistan's Workers' Party in three different camps that lie within the Turkish borders, was filmed during the ongoing peace process between the Turkish government and the PKK. However, upon its completion in 2015, the peace process has disintegrated and its first screening, which was supposed to be held at the 34th Istanbul Film Festival, was cancelled. In the meantime, Chayan Demirel's heart stopped for a period of time and he was hospitalized for months. Now Demirel has a 99% disabled report, which the court board did not take into consideration upon sentencing. This report is proof of the state of Demirel's health, demonstrating the degree to which his speaking and seeing abilities have diminished, that he has difficulties walking and is unable to attend to his most basic needs on his own. The decision has been objected against at the Court of Appeals. Like all the other disabled citizens of the country, Demirel wants to benefit from his rights. He requests that whatever needs to be done for a person with a 99% disabled report to be done and that the obstacles put in front of his right to retire be removed. We are back in the studio with John Jandan. John Jandan is a, a faculty member at Boğaziçi University, Department of Western Languages and Literature. He's also a documentary filmmaker. Uh, Mr. Jandan, you've uh, written extensively on documentary filmmaking, and you have also uh, made many documentaries yourself. Recently, one called My Child, which uh, documents uh, very courageous parents of LGBTI members here in Turkey. Uh, I would like to ask you some questions relating to the documentary filmmaking uh, scene um, in Turkey. Uh, starting in, uh, well, in 2014, uh, you had resigned as head of the jury of the National Documentary Film Competition at Antalya International Film Festival due to uh, censorship uh, regarding Rayan Tuvi's documentary about the Gezi Park protests. Following that, uh, several acts of solidarity ensued, such as um, the cancellation, oh, well, due to the cancellation of the national competitions, a national competition started to be organized in Istanbul in protest of Antalya. 
similar acts of solidarity ensued the following year when uh, Bakur was censored at the Istanbul Film Festival, uh, at the 34th Istanbul Film Festival at the last minute. So uh, how do you think acts of solidarity have evolved since? Do you believe that there's a widespread solidarity among filmmakers and the film festival at large? Mm -hmm. Um, as you have mentioned, there have been numerous acts of solidarity uh, since 2014, uh, the, um, the cancellation of the national uh, documentary competition at Antalya. But these ha acts, uh, in my opinion, have not really culminated uh, in a widespread movement of opposition against various forms of repression, uh, censorship being uh, one of them. Uh, unfortunately, people seem to be conditioned to believe uh, that they are powerless against uh, the powers that be. I think we need to find a way to inject uh, more courage uh, back into people, I think. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the film festivals, both in uh, Adana and Antalya, now that the municipalities have shift changed from the AKP to CHP, have reinstated, for example, the national competitions. Mm. Uh, do you believe, do you think that the, these film festivals have done enough, have confronted uh, what has been happening since 2014? Absolutely not. Um, in my opinion, um, festivals are institutional entities uh, with an institutional, institutional heritage. Um, a true act of facing their past, I think, would entail taking institutional responsibility for the wrongs that they have been, uh, that have been committed. Uh, that would be officially recognizing uh, what has happened, officially mm -hmm. apologizing to those affected and seeking some form of uh, remediation, such as organizing screenings of censored films and org organizing appropriate discussions, shedding light on what has happened. Uh, in my opinion, the change of metropolitan municipalities uh, has yet to produce in, any concrete uh, results vis-a-vis -vis, uh, censorship mm -hmm. um, in making these festivals more uh, free and uh, reputable, I think. Uh, so we shall see. Mm -hmm. uh, well, as mentioned in our uh, news package, uh, Chayan Demiras and Arturo Mavio's film North has not only been censored, but now the both directors are being persecuted for uh, their film. And this is not the first time one of Chayan's films is being persecuted. Um, and as a matter of fact, the Altia's film magazine crew have been gathering a list of uh, censorship and persecutions of uh, artists uh, in the visual arts um, at the moment um, who are being trialed for terrorist propaganda specifically. Um, so could you underline perhaps the commonalities in these films? And if we think of censorship as uh, the removal of forbidden knowledges from circulation, um, how would you describe the forbidden knowledges in these persecuted films? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, firstly, I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues at Altius uh, for uh, you know, doing such uh, service uh, by uh, chronicling uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, um, situations, situations yeah. and, and, and, and these cases, actually. Um, so what's common to the, about these uh, film, filmmakers and films is that they're all calling attention to the government's uh, violation of human rights or portraying um, Kurdish people as human beings. Um, the state needs to keep on portraying the Kurds as enemies, uh, as inhuman uh, to justify its actions, I think, uh, and also needs to keep the public in the dark about uh, the human rights violations. And these uh, filmmakers are putting uh, a spoke in the wheel, so to speak, with their films. Uh, for example, Özay Şahin has been on trial for seven years with an accusation of making propaganda and helping a terrorist organization. Why? because she was the cameraman on the 2012 documentary by Mizgin Müjda Arslan uh, about her father. Uh, so can't two women work together to make a film about the director's search for a father she has never seen because the father left the family to join the guerrillas uh, years and years ago. Her next trial date is uh, set for March 24th, uh, and if declared guilty, Özay Şahin is facing a long jail term. Another example, Veysiye Atay. Uh, Veysiye has been sentenced to two and a half years uh, in jail uh, for making propaganda for a terrorist organization again. Same accusation. Uh, with this 2015 documentary, Nujin, uh, it means new life in Kurdish, 
uh, about three women in Kobane in Syria uh, who have been fighting against the ISIS. Um, so don't we as a public have the right to see a documentary about three women who are fighting against ISIS? Another uh, example is the case of Kazem Kuzul. Uh, he has been taken into custody and spent three months in jail while he was filming a 2017 uh, referendum protest. He was uh, sentenced for insulting the president, another accusation uh, that is common. Um, another case uh, is with documentary filmmaker and activist Oktay Inge. Uh, he was arrested on May 30th, uh, 2019, for chaining himself in front of the Ministry of Culture in Ankara. Why was he doing this? Well, because he was demanding the return of his archives, which was confiscated uh, by the police in October 2018. Mm -hmm. To this date, he's been continuing with his protests and demanding the return of his archives, his basic right. Um, and back to uh, Chayan Demiral and Arturul Maviolu, um, the documentary filmmaker and journalist team uh, went uh, for months and chronicled, um, um, actually witnessed uh, the withdrawal of Kurdish guerrillas uh, in a period of cease ceasefire uh, between the Turkish government and the PKK uh, from the territory of Turkey. Uh, so the name Bakur in, in Kurdish, which means mm -hmm. north in, Turk, in English, uh, uh, has to do with this period of uh, peace, actually, of this uh, uh, ceasefire uh, that was taking place. Uh, now they've been sentenced to four and a half years in jail for making propaganda for a terrorist organization again. Um, so don't we, as the public, have the right to see such a documentary about an important period in our recent history? Uh, when an end to violence and a peaceful resolution seem to be coming. Yeah. Uh, also, as you mentioned in your uh, uh, segment, um, Chayan Demiral, who's facing this four and a half year jail term right now, is 99% um, uh, disabled because his heart, he had a cardiac arrest in 2015 and he had to spend a lot of uh, time uh, in the hospital and he's still in recovery and he has uh, this, uh, um, he, it's, it's, he has this proof that he is 99% uh, disabled. Now, the state wants to send a 99% disabled person to jail. Not only that, but also the state is um, uh, punishing him by not giving him um, his um, retirement benefits as a disabled person. So, uh, obviously, you know, this is a violation after a violation. Um, Unfortunately, the laws uh, that are in the books are used selectively in Turkey. Those who support the government are not pr prosecuted, and those who oppose the government are prosecuted. Mm -hmm. For example, a mafia leader can say that he wants to take a shower with the blood uh, of the academics for peace, and that is considered by the courts uh, to be um, um, uh, freedom of his expression. Uh, or a newspaper can fr print a homophobic um, headline calling gays dishonorable faggots. And a prosecutor could declare that there is no violation in that hate speech. Um, and that, now let's talk about this propaganda for a terrorist organization. Uh, I'd like to call attention to the law itself as it is in the books right now. In 2013, to better conform with the Uni uh, European Union's freedom of expression standards, some amendments were made uh, to the anti-terror law which is uh, clause uh, 7, 7 uh, slash 2, to clear, clearly distinguish between what is free speech and what is making propaganda for a terrorist organization. So the law criminalizes speech only if the content legitimizes or encourages acts of violence, threats, or force. This is in the books. Only if the content of the speech legitimizes or encourages acts of violence, threats, or force. So how does any of these documentary films legitimize, legitimize or encourage acts of violence, threats, or force? Where, where is the proof? So these are ridiculous accusations and unlawful judgments, making these legal actions clear violations of the rights of freedom of expression. These violations, threats, and intimidation are not just directed to these individual filmmakers or these films. These are directed to all filmmakers in Turkey. 
And that's why we need to uh, speak out about these uh, violations, uh, we meaning uh, all filmmakers mm -hmm. and, and the public at large. Yeah, well, as a matter of fact, the official reason given for uh, the cancellation of uh, North's uh, screening at the Istanbul Film Festival and the festivals that ensued was because it didn't have a registration document. So, uh, I mean, registration documents were always mandatory for festivals, but it was never, um, you know, enforced. Exactly. So could you perhaps explain why all of a sudden this gained an importance for the Ministry of Culture and how yeah. it impacted documentary filmmaking particularly? Yeah, I mean, in 2015, up to the point of where, when um, Bakur's screening was uh, programmed, there were many films that were uh, screened without this document. Yeah. So uh, again, this is another uh, example of how the laws could be uh, used selectively, and in this case, misused uh, to censor and to, uh, and, and, and to punish uh, again. Um, this registration document actually is a document that is used um, in many countries, uh, not just in Turkey, to specify the copyright holder and also to uh, classify the film uh, with a rating, like, such as you know, uh, 18 plus mm -hmm. or you know, 13 plus or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, to kind of classify, you know, which age group it's appropriate to. Um, whereas in our country, unfortunately, this document is used as, as, a, as a means to uh, censor uh, certain films that are, that is labeled as uh, oppositional or, or anti-state. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so um, in a true dem democracy, we as the public should be able to see these films um, so that we can decide to agree or disagree uh, with their point, uh, po uh, points of view or their politics so that we can freely discuss and debate the issues raised by these films. Um, by criminalizing these films and filmmakers, the state is actually violating our rights as viewers, uh, as the public, uh, to be able to have free access to this information. And this information is crucial in a democracy. So we can have a democratic discussion about issues mm -hmm. that are um, you know, pertaining to our lives now or to our future and the decisions we're gonna make mm -hmm. about our own future mm -hmm. as, a, as a collective, as, as, as the public. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean... Uh, yes, the, the, the lack of this registration document basically confines these films to private screenings. Yes, although yeah. some festivals uh, still um, you know, show films without this uh, documentation, mm -hmm. uh, festivals need to be uh, places where um, non-commercial films uh, could be screened. Uh, that's what festivals are for. You know, not every film gets um, a commercial release. Not every film gets to be shown in movie theaters and, uh, you know, and distributed all over the country. So festivals are these unique spaces where independent films that are just finished could uh, reach the public and have their first public screenings. If they want to go on to um, a commercial distribution, okay, then require the documentation. But uh, festivals need to be these free public spaces mm -hmm. where uh, filmmakers could meet uh, with, with their audiences and the films could meet uh, with their viewers. Mm -hmm. uh, so freedom of expression is clearly a, one of the main issues or the most pressing issues both in academia and in the film industry. Mm -hmm. uh, but these are not just issues relevant to these two industries. So how could we perhaps uh, shift the conversation from being contained to specific industries and turn it into a, a larger political struggle relevant to all? I think we need to see the fact that uh, these are all, as you said, are uh, issues uh, related to freedom of expression and freedom of expression is not just about uh, filmmakers' freedom of expressions, expression or the um, politicians' uh, freedom of expression, but freedom of expression is, is a right that we all should uh, enjoy as a, as a society. And, and that is one of the conditions uh, for a democratic society. Mm -hmm. So if, you wanna live, if we, uh, as the public, uh, want to live in a society uh, that is uh, truly democratic, we really need to come together and, um, and defend our basic rights and, and freedom of expression is one of those basic and very important rights because we need to um, have an exchange of opinions and thoughts 
uh, and, we, and we need to be able to have free um, productive discussions about issues. Mm -hmm. And without freedom of expression, we can't have these kind of discussions, which means that we can't really move forward uh, as a society. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Mr. Jandan, for joining us this evening in You're the welcome. studio and for your words. Thank you. I, I, if, if, if we have uh, another minute, I'd like to call attention once again to what we're trying to do with Chayan's case. Uh, yes, as uh, friends of Chayan and colleagues of Chayan, uh, we're actually um, and calling on um, the public, especially all cinema lovers and um, uh, filmmakers uh, and public at large, to join us to call attention to this violation of um, freedom of expression and violations of rights of a disabled person in the case of Chayan. Mm -hmm. And uh, next week is actually Chayan's birthday, so we're organizing uh, um, a celebration on Chayan's birthday. So everybody is uh, welcome to join us. Uh, it's going to take place on January 24th at 7 p.m. at Jezair Meeting Hall. That's uh, next uh, week again. Uh, so let's come together, uh, uh, let's celebrate Chayan and also uh, call attention to the violations. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much for that reminder. Thank, thank you, you for being here. Thanks. Thank you. Four people were detained when Egyptian police raided the Cairo office of Turkey's state-run Anadolu agency on Tuesday. One of the detainees has been released, but the reason for their detention and the whereabouts of the three others are currently still unknown. The agency said that police teams shut down security cameras and cut off internet access in the office while they were carrying out searches in the building, as well as seizing passports, cell phones, and computers of the employees. The Turkish Foreign Ministry condemned the incident, saying that Ankara expects the agency's employees to be released. This is an act of harassment and intimidation against Turkish press, and we strongly condemn it. The ministry statement read, adding that the raid and detention show the calamity of the issues of democracy and transparency in Egypt. The European Alliance of News Agencies Thursday called on Egypt to release Anadolu Agency employees detained during the raid. The European Alliance of News Agencies considers that the Egyptian authorities should immediately release the detained journalists and inform the international public on what were the legal grounds of their initial arrest, the alliance said in a statement. One of the four employees detained has arrived back in Turkey earlier today. Hilmi Balja said he felt the support of his nation and government while being held in Egypt, expressing his gratitude to the country's president, foreign minister and communications director, as well as Anadolu Agency's director. Director General Şenol Kazanca for their efforts. Kazanca said he expects the agency's remaining employees will be released soon. India is planning to cut some imports from Turkey as a response to the country's criticism against India's Kashmir policy. The Indian government is planning to cut imports of oil and steel products from Turkey. Our government has not taken kindly the comments of Malaysia and Turkey and we will restrict trade from those countries, a state official said, according to Reuters. Muslim-majority Kashmir is claimed and hold by India and Pakistan and ruled in part by both. The Indian government withdrew the autonomy of Kashmir last year in August to tighten its grip on the region, shutting down internet access in the region and detaining activists and politicians. President Erdogan had said 8 million people were virtually under blockade in the region during his speech at the UN General Assembly in September. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi suspended his official visit to Turkey after Erdogan's speech. The volume of trade between Turkey and India exceeded $8 billion in 2018. Human Rights Watch has released its World Report 2020, where it reviews human rights issues in more than 100 countries. Among several pressing issues, the report calls on Turkey to release jailed critics and respect election results. The report commented on the state of the human rights record after the end of the state of emergency, stating that the restrictive powers and practices ending in July 2018 have set back Turkey's human rights record, with terrorism charges continued to be widely misused in the third year after the coup attempt. While the Erdogan's presidency's judicial reform amendment package adopted by the parliament in October amended various laws, it was too generalized and vague to offer hopes of genuine measures to address the deep and pervasive deficiencies 
of Turkey's justice system. The report further provided information under the heading of Freedom of Expression, Association and Assembly, wherein the number of journalists under persecution, the state of the media and access to internet are detailed. The report notes that there has been a dramatic rise in the number of prosecutions and convictions on charges of insulting the president since Erdogan took office in 2014. Further headings include human rights defenders, detailing the increase in targeting human rights defenders, specifically addressing the cases of Osman Kavala, Tahir Elçi and LGBTI rights groups. A further heading detailed the rise in allegations of torture and ill-treatment in custody and abductions. The report also highlighted developments in the Kurdish conflict as well as the crackdown on the opposition. Finally, the report also included an assessment on the situation of refugees and migrants in Turkey. For Human Rights Watch, Emma Sinclair Webb spoke to Mediascope and assessed this year's report on Turkey. Human Rights Watch yesterday released its World Report, which is a survey of countries around the world in terms of their human rights records. Uh, in the chapter on Turkey, uh, we in particular look at the deterioration in the rule of law and democracy framework and under different headings consider uh, the particular developments uh, over the course of 2019. Uh, in particular, in this year's report, we look at the way in which uh, the presidency and the government of Turkey uh, in particular uh, attempted to question the results of the local elections back in March 2019. We also look at um, the government's uh, removal of uh, Kurdish mayors uh, elected uh, on the HDP ticket uh, and how those mayors um, have been systematically removed and often detained. Uh, to date, there are 32 municipalities in the southeast and eastern provinces of Turkey that have been taken over by government-appointed trustees. In the course of 2019, we've seen the continuing use of terrorism charges or misuse of terrorism charges against uh, perceived government critics and courts accepting highly flawed indictments. We've long recognised that there's been uh, an excessive degree of political control over judicial decisions. And I think in the last two years, this is be beginning to be accepted by the European Court of Human Rights. There were two important cases that show this. Uh, one actually completed in 2018 uh, against uh, concerning the case of um, the jailed former HDP co-chair Selatin Demirtas. Uh, and the other uh, was a case concerning the human rights defender Osman Kavala. And to date, uh, Turkey has not implemented either of those rulings. I think that's a very significant development and it shows um, also that there is increasing international recognition of the highly political uh, decision making um, of courts and how this is, uh, there is an excessive degree of executive control over the judiciary in Turkey. I think one of the uh, most important developments about 2019 was the way in which the government and the presidency started to question uh, the results of elections. And that is um, a development that we haven't seen so much in previous years. Uh, the rerunning of the Istanbul election was very significant in that respect because it was conducted in a way uh, on the basis of a decision which uh, really had lacked uh, sort of real legal criteria. Another area where I think we've seen a decline in Turkey is in the treatment of Syrian refugees. Turkey has very generously hosted Syrian refugees in very great numbers for many years. Uh, and we began to see a real reverse of policy uh, in respect of refugees, with some refugees being deported to Syria um, and you know, made to sign voluntary return forms, which were coercively um, it made, they were coercively made to sign those forms and we, our research really um, demonstrated that. So I think that does spell um, a fatigue with uh, hosting so many refugees and a change in government policy. Other areas that uh, raise great concerns are military operations um, outside the country, both in northeast Syria and potentially in the future also in Libya, um, where the whole question of abuses committed by 
the Turkish military or its proxies will be highlighted and uh, these will be of the very significant for human rights groups. A one-off performance performance based on jailed former People's Democratic Party co-chair Selahattin Demirtas's book Devran took place in Istanbul on Saturday. Interior Minister Süleyman Soylu condemned the high-profile figures for their attendance of the event. Among those in attendance at the play were Demirtas's wife, Başak Demirtas, lawmakers from the HDP and Republican People's Party, and Istanbul Mayor Ekrem İmamoğlu's wife, Dilek İmamoğlu. Legendary actor Kadir İnanır was also part of the audience. Interior Minister Süleyman Soylu has targeted the people who watched the play during a speech he made on January 12th at the opening of a ski center on Ilgaz Mountain in central Anatolia. The play they saw was created by those who hurt this country's people, by those who don't want us to succeed. You can't clean the blood on your hands with theater plays, he said. Soylu went on to criticize renowned Turkish actor Kadir İnanır for his attendance. Demirtaş pans the play and others watch and applaud it. You haven't done enough, Mr. Kadir. Kadir İnanır has responded to criticism, saying that he attended the play to promote peace. The issue is promoting peace. We were there for peace. You shouldn't be concerned about these little things, Inanır said on January 15. Devran is a concept in Turkish that means earth, time and fate. It is the second book Demirtas penned during his three years of imprisonment. Devran contains 14 stories and was adapted to stage by artists Judy de Kural and Ömer Şahin. Demirtas was arrested on November 4, 2016 on charges related to the PKK, a group designated as a terrorist organization by Turkey, the United States and the European Union. Turkish authorities accuse HDP lawmakers and members of having links to the PKK with a number of its former deputies and dozens of local officials being in jail. That's all from this week in Turkey. See you next Friday at 9 p.m. Good night.